Super Mario Wonder is a great game and I'm having a lot of fun with it. One thing I didn't expect to like as much as I do is the soundtrack, specifically how fun and interactive it is. Video game music compared to other forms of media is unique in that it's able to change and react to a player's actions, even simply changing the music depending on which level or location the player is at. Over the years, especially with the advent of middleware, which we'll talk about in a second, video game music has only become more interactive. Ironically, some of the most interactive modern AAA games, at least anecdotally, feel more like rigid film scores that just happen to serendipitously sync with player actions. You can play a combat section of Spider-Man 2, for instance, and hear the combat music seamlessly transition to the swinging music once you jump off of a building, which almost magically ends at the perfect point once you decide to land. But we're not here to talk about Spider-Man, we're here to talk about the Super Mario. And also Luigi, Peach, Daisy, both Toast Sodette, all for Yoshi's and Nabbit. Mario has historically done some really cool interactive things with its music. One of the earliest instances of interactive layering in a game that I can remember was in Super Mario World. It's very simple, but when you're writing Yoshi, the game adds a subtle bongo layer to the music. I always thought this was super neat. The Mario series has always had a lot of fun with this, things like lowering the volume of the music during underwater sections. Or one of my personal favorites, changing the actual speed of the song and adding instrumental layers depending on player speed in this Mario Galaxy level. So how are these things programmed into the game? Nintendo most likely uses something called audio middleware, a type of program that interfaces with game engines and allows them to have more interactive audio capabilities, which would otherwise be very difficult to program or outright impossible. The most common programs are FMOD and WISE, but as Nintendo uses their own proprietary game engines for their first party games, they most likely use their own middleware as well. I actually learned how to use WISE in college, so let's open WISE and I'll demonstrate how to program interactive music. Yeah, I don't remember how to use any of this. So usually, interactive video game music has just two components, the horizontal and the vertical. Horizontal is probably what you're most familiar with. It's everything that has to do with time. The most basic form of horizontal movement is the music simply playing. It then has the option to do a few different things, such as looping once it gets to the end, or branching at any point to a different track depending on player input, such as moving from Tilted Towers to Loot Lake. The verticality in video game music deals with layering, you can have separate tracks that are in sync with the tempo of the tracks underneath, allowing the player to seamlessly toggle instruments or textures on and off, or even crossfade between different layers. Let's look at the Super Mario World music with Yoshi as an example of how this works. Notice the interplay with the horizontal movement. The track plays at a fixed speed, the bongo seamlessly enter when Mario gets on Yoshi, and the bongo layer deactivates when he gets off Yoshi. The majority of interactive game music follows the same principle, just with more complexity and sometimes adding branching perhaps. So how does the Mario Galaxy rolling ball level work? This time, both the vertical and horizontal are directly controlled by the player in real time. Mario's speed on the ball both changes the intensity of the song by adding or subtracting vertical layers, and also changes the horizontal tempo of the song. But it's not very simple to accomplish this, because if the game just sped up the playback of the music, the pitch would change and the audio would get a tad distorted. Instead, I'm pretty sure this is all MIDI data that is performed in real time by the engine, and the engine is able to change the playback speed of the notes corresponding to Mario's speed. But there is still more to this, because Mario's speed also controls which instruments are playing at any given moment. When he's standing still, the music changes to be a more sad, minimal rendition of the theme. But when he's really moving, the minimal layer fades out and the more intense instrumental layers fade in. All of 
this means that Mario's speed is both a horizontal and vertical parameter, kind of a diagonal parameter. But we're still not done, because when you go into a launch star, this happens. The music changes pitch upwards as well as speeding up and adding the vertical layers, but since it's not an audio file and this is being performed in real time by the engine, the only thing that would make sense is if a pitch band effect is applied to all of the instruments manually, which is insane. Anyways, I guess my point for all of this is, they went above and beyond for the music of what is otherwise a small and relatively insignificant level in the game, and that not only shows the creativity of the Mario sound team, but also how audio interactivity can make even the small levels so memorable. So we're this far and we haven't even talked about Mario Wonder yet, so let's just get right to it. At this point in the script, I've only played through about half of the game, so I'm sure there's so many cool things later I haven't even seen yet that I'd love to talk about. By far, the most prominent example of fun, interactive music in the game is the Piranha Plants on Parade level. Once you grab the Wonder Seed, the Piranha Plants start coming out of the woodwork to serenade Mario. <laughs> about this is, the level design matches what's happening in the music. After a short intro, three piranha plants will come out of their pipes and run towards you while singing in time with the backing track. When they leave through a pipe shortly after appearing, their part in the music ends and other piranha plants enter to sing their parts, which also ends once they leave through their pipes. The sequence continues with increasing intensity. More piranha plants enter at once, big piranha plants enter while singing lower tenor parts, and the sequence ends with a bunch of them singing a climactic ending. So even though this section does use layering, it's not necessarily interactive. But if you kill the piranha plants while they're singing, their parts disappear from the music. It's even possible to hear sections of just backing track instrumental if you can kill all of them quickly enough. So cool, honestly. Even though it doesn't change much, it makes this fantastical and bizarre sequence strangely immersive, I guess. At the very least, this track will sound different on every person's playthrough because the amount of piranha plants they kill and the timing of it will always be different. The track endears the helpless piranha plants to the player by making their death impactful. They are permanently gone from the song if you kill them and you can hear it. But I don't know your life. You may be numb to killing video game plants because you killed Flowey in your playthrough of Undertale. <laughs> There are many other instances of interactive audio in Mario Wonder, like the classic low-pass filter when you burrow into the ground using the drill power-up, and using proximity-based music to reveal secret areas. Let's get to the main event, the thing that inspired this video in the first place. This guy. These note blocks are absolutely insane. When Mario or any other entity comes into contact with one of these note blocks, all that happens is, predictably, a note is produced. Running across a line of these blocks produces a musical scale. Also, at any point, Mario can jump off of any of these blocks, which produces an arpeggio. Yahoo! But what makes this so cool is that the scale and or arpeggio that plays directly corresponds to the chord that is currently playing in the level's background music. This isn't the first game to do this. One example I can think of off the top of my head is Celeste. The sound effect when activating the torches in this level will change to harmonize with the chord that is playing in the background music.
But if we're talking just Nintendo games, Mario Wonder still isn't the first to do this. In Animal Crossing New Horizons, every single melodic instrument can be interacted with, playing randomized notes that adhere to the chords heard in the background music, even if you change the music by playing a KK Slider song. Even if we're talking just Mario games, it still isn't even the first game to do this. In Mario Odyssey, many components of the game, usually captures, feature melodic sound effects that adhere to the chords of the music and harmonize with it. Someone actually made a video about this a while ago, so go check it out and see more examples if you'd like. But anyways, what makes Mario Wonder's note blocks so unique for me is that they're featured in the level design. It isn't an optional piece of furniture you purchase and accidentally discover like Animal Crossing, or subtle sound design like in Mario Odyssey. The note blocks are an overt game mechanic with unnecessarily complicated sound design. But after all, I guess they literally are called note blocks. Programming this takes both a certain level of expertise in interactive audio implementation as well as understanding of jazz theory, so let's break down both of those and see how it all comes together to make a note block. To understand the note block, we must first understand chord scales. Chord scales are exactly what they sound like. We take a chord, we flatten it out, and then fill in the notes using a technique we'll explain in a second. The main purpose of a chord skill is to know which notes sound the best played at the same time as the chord, as well as which jazzier notes you can stack on top of the chord. Most chords consist of four notes, the root, third, fifth, and seventh. Often, chords omit that top note, leaving us with just those first three notes instead, the root, third, and fifth. Most scales consist of seven distinct notes moving up in sequence before arriving back at the higher version of the root. Chord scales are always relative to the context they appear in, so let's use the Mario Wonder theme as an example. Our chord progression is as follows. G major, E7, A minor 7, and D7. And our song is in the key of G major. So let's make some chord scales, starting with our first chord. To make a chord scale, we generally follow a few very simple rules. First, we find all of the chord tones, the aforementioned root, 3rd, 5th, and 7th. That already gives us 4 notes, so to get the other 3, we just fill in the gaps with notes from the scale of the key that we're in. In this case, we're in G major. And that gives us the chord scale G major. Well, that makes sense, considering that this is the G major chord and we're in the key of G major. So let's take a look at another chord. We'll skip this one for now and take a look at A minor 7. Here we have the four chord tones, and we'll fill in the gaps with the diatonic notes of the G major scale, since even though the chord is A minor, we're still in the key of G major. That gives us the A Dorian scale. A kind of vaguely minor flavored scale. Moving on to D7, we have our four chord tones, and filling in the gaps using the notes of the G major scale gives us this. The G Mixolydian scale, a bluesy major-ish scale. So you might be thinking, what is the point of this disgusting, disgusting jazz stuff, especially if all of the scales we've seen thus far are literally just the notes of G major in a different order? If the point is to know which notes sound good over the chord, why not just use G major through all of this? Well, chord scales show the weight of the notes in the chord. If you're using chord scales to write a melody, for instance, you usually wouldn't want to emphasize A, C, and E over the chord of G major, because even though those chords sound good in G major, it would bring a sort of A minor vibe to the chord that G major doesn't really like. The chord tones are going to be notes that feel the most stable. Let's look at the melody of the Mario Wonder theme again. 
This time, I've highlighted all of the chord tones. Notice how even though there are some notes in the melody that aren't chord tones, much of the emphasis is on them. It just provides the most stable sound in most cases. But specific chord scales serve one more purpose, when something isn't found in the key signature. Let's look at that chord we skipped over earlier, E7. The chord tones are as follows, E, G sharp, B, and D. Of these, E, B, and D are diatonic to G major. But notice how G sharp is nowhere to be found. That's totally fine, because this chord is a slightly jazzier one that serves to set up the next chord, and that G sharp is an important part of that. So like earlier, let's fill in the gaps using diatonic notes. And that gives us this interesting scale called E mixolydian flat 13. So with that, our four chord scales are done. We can spam these chord scales over the Mario Wonder track and it'll sound great. After all, listen to how good it sounds compared to just playing G major over everything. skills can get much more complicated, but this is honestly the majority of it. It's the basis of melody writing, creating more complex chords, and improvising over chords in jazz, for instance. But most importantly, it's the music theory of how these colorful little note blocks operate. Now, let's take a look at how these are implemented into the game. To make these note blocks play the appropriate chord scale, the first thing the game needs to know is when the chords begin and end in the level music. This is accomplished by implementing a grid in the audio middleware that lines up with the tempo of the song, and then manually going through and marking the points where the chords begin and end. Then, these chunks are programmed with hooks that tell the game which chord scale to use while that chunk is active, or in other words, while a chord is heard in the music, the corresponding chord scale is activated. So now the chunks have to correspond to the appropriate notes of the chord scale. This could be done in a few different ways, but I imagine they just have an audio file for every single possible note block note, and then the chunks are programmed to choose specific notes from the pool according to the chord scale. Now the final step is programming the note blocks themselves. Each note block could be assigned a number value in the code, and that number corresponds to a number note in the chord scale. And with that, everything is complete. Mario steps on the note blocks, the game knows which pool of notes to use, and we hear a beautiful little sequence of cute marimba notes that infallibly harmonize with the background music at any given point, regardless of the order and timing of the player stepping on the blocks. There are sometimes exceptions to the note blocks playing chord skills, though. Sometimes, like in Piranha Plants on Parade, the note blocks will adhere to the melody notes rather than the underlying chord scale. Let's take a listen. <laughs> This functions the exact same way as the chord scales programming, but this time only the melody notes were programmed in, rather than the chord scales, and the note blocks are only given one option to play at any given point in the melody. But there is still one final thing the game does with these note blocks. As mentioned earlier, when you jump, the note blocks produce a little arpeggio, which is the chord tones of the given chord played in an ascending sequence. The game uses these same hooks for the chord scales, but also marks all of the chord tones of the given chord scale, playing a few of them in quick succession if the player chooses to jump while standing on a note block. Listen to the arpeggio changing when I jump at different times in the music. Just absolutely insane programming on behalf of the audio team. Admittedly, though the broad strokes are probably correct, I could definitely have missed some details on how they did it specifically. If any of you tinkerers who already took apart the game know better than I, please let me know in the comments, I'd love to know. Also, the last video I posted was unexpectedly very popular, and I want to thank everyone so much, both people who are new to the channel and subscribers who have been here since day one. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit that bell, because it really helps me out a lot. 
And if you have any suggestions for what I should cover next, let me know in the comments. Now, if I never have to think about chord scales ever again, it'll be too soon. You forgot the diminished chord scale! Thank <laughs> you.